this morning. He's so worthy of our praise. He's here. He's moving in our midst. Rain. 
set our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. You are all together lovely. Jesus. God, we just ignore all the waves that might be surrounding us right now. And we set our eyes on you.
that we have to express ourselves before you, to express our love and our adoration of you, Lord, to be able to, to speak out your praises. Lord, this morning we, we thank you for that opportunity. When we know around the world there are so many, so many different countries where people can't do that but we can Father we love you we're here because we love you we're here because we're drawn by the love of God Father we pray that you'll just bless us today as we bless you with our praise Father we just ask for your love and your guidance Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Praise God. Glory to God. What do you think, worship team? <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Hallelujah. I'm excited. Sorry? You want me to come back here? All right. They're telling me where I can stand. I'm making noises now, aren't I? Can you hear? Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Welcome. Yes. I've got a wee word. Have you? All right. Yep. Awesome. Is it like it or in? <laughs> Anyway, and you think, oh, I should have known that. I, I would have known. Didn't I know that? And it came through a song by Paul Wilbur. And in that song, there was just a line that really hit my heart. And it said, basically, that our hearts are where heaven and earth collide. And I went, oh, that just seemed to open up a new a new look at what heaven will do on the earth. And it was going to be through my heart, your heart, and how we bring it out to the people around us. And it gave me like a, an understanding of the river of God coming through his people. So heaven and earth collide. Earth, not as in the world, but earth as in the earth and the people in it, not the system of the world. So heaven and earth collide in our hearts. And of course, the Holy Spirit is the one who dwells in our hearts. Jesus is the one who we're seated with in heavenly places. And this flow goes this way. So how we look after our hearts is very precious to God. Anyway, be blessed by it. I'm excited. Praise God. Thank you, Jenny. So watch out for that collision because God is moving. Um, I just have one announcement. The most important one. Two announcements. All right. Next Saturday's, well, Jan's not here. Do you know any details? I don't know any details. 
Okay, it's Community Day next Saturday, so, and I think, Josh, you're organising with the lovely young people, and we want the, the, the middle-aged and the, um, the, the very young grey-haired ones who are capable of being there, and I think 9.30, 9.30 we will be here. Meeting outside the old Oh, okay, meeting outside. Yeah. There you go, in the car park, guys. So bring your, bring your spades, your hedge cutters, bring your, trailers. your trailers. Bring your trailers. Yeah. Uh, all your gardening things. Bring your pruning shears. And uh, we'll feed you nicely and keep you going because there's a bit to do at my house too. So yeah. there we go. And um, Jan has got a list and he's contacted the people in the community. Okay. Sorry? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, we'll feed you all the lunch. Yep, no problem. Yep, we'll have the lunch here, but we'll sort that when everybody gathers. So look forward to seeing you, all 50 of you. Exciting. All right, there's one other announcement, and that is that next Saturday night, we're going to have a movie here. And it's going to be called Courageous. And uh, you know that Jonah and I are heading to Africa in seven weeks. Seven weeks tomorrow. But we need some money. So what we're going to do is the, the three times three trust, which is a trust that I set up to support the ministry that I do. And perhaps I could just take a moment to explain to you why it's called three times three, because what it does is it works mainly with, with youth, and uh, the idea is the spiritual, the personal, and the physical. And the spiritual is made up of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the personal is body, soul, and spirit, and the physical is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and what the idea is, is that with young people all around the world, I've been doing this over the last 10 years, we've brought them to know Jesus and to know the spiritual side, and then we've looked at their giftings and helped them to get to, um, to, get to um, school and university or a job that relates to their giftings, and then taught them that, that once they can, they can get all that going in their lives, they'll always have breakfast, lunch, and dinner available. And so Jonah and I are going to, if you don't know Jonah, there's his mother and his sister there. We're going to go for um, 55 days, I think I worked it out. And, and we're going to be in... in um, Uganda first, and then we're going to be in Kenya and perhaps Tanzania. And so next, next Saturday at 7 here, we're going to have the movie Courageous. And did you just give them all one of these, did you? All right, so I don't need to wrap it on any longer. Um, there's going to be dessert and coffee and, and some um, raffles for, to raise some money, and um, adults are $10, school children 5 and families $25. So God bless you. So the children are going somewhere, are they? I think um, our prayer pastor, Fungo, is going to take them. And, and the rest of us, the rest of us, do you think that somebody could actually get, get me a drink of water? That would be really nice. Thank you, Jenny. We're going to turn to um, Hebrews chapter 12. Praise God. Let's just ask God to bless the word to us and bless what he's got to say. Father, we just ask right now that you'd speak to us by your spirit, Lord. 
that today we would hear what your Spirit is saying to us. And that, Lord, that you would just speak into our hearts, that we would be equipped to do the work that you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Hebrews chapter 12 says this, first one. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Today, we live, thank you, Jimmy. Today, we live in an amazing time. You know, we live in a world that's, that's falling apart. But we're not falling apart. Are you falling apart? Yes. Not yet. <laughs> I'm not going to fall apart. I, you know, I've been around for a while now. And there's been so many things in my life that have tried to make me fall apart. And here I am. I am still here. I woke up this morning and I, I spent my time with God and I had a look on my, on my um, uh, device and saw the news about the people in, in America and they're rioting all over America because they're not allowed to kill babies anymore. Hallelujah. They are burning down things and they are riot rioting because they want the right to kill babies. But the interesting thing is that the law was changed on Friday so that they can no longer kill babies. Amen. And that was a mighty triumph. And also during the week, I read a survey in America. And the last, in the last 10 years, the people that believe in God has dropped 7% in America from 87% to 80 If only it was like that in our country. If only it was like that in our nation where, where 80% of the people still would say that they believed in God. Because if we had that, well, then we would see the same thing that happened in America this week happen here. Our Prime Minister stood up and she said she was upset because it's put women's rights back many years what happened in America. I don't think killing babies has anything to do with women's rights. And if they're talking about health, the health of the woman, there's lots of preventative things that we have in our nation that can stop people getting pregnant. And I can't see, even if you did get pregnant, why you have to wait 20 weeks to decide whether to abort or not. But why I'm talking about this is, is because you and I, we have a responsibility now. We have a responsibility to uphold the Word of God. The scripture that I read says, Therefore we also, 
since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And, and Hebrews chapter 11 lists a whole lot of people like David and Moses and all, all the sort, Gideon, and all these people that stood up before, for God. But in our own town, in our own community, we have, ha- we have people that have stood up for the righteousness and the power and the authority and the message of salvation to the communities. And as people turn their backs on that message, well, there is more crime, there is more violence, there is, there is no use, there's no use being alive. There's no need, there's no need to, to have any boundaries because their concept of life is that we're born and we die. And what you do in between doesn't really matter as long as it, it gives you pleasure. And that can't work out. That does not work out. So we've been surrounded over, over 150 years in this town. People have brought the gospel. People whose names we'll never know. People whose lives we'll probably never know about. But they brought the message of salvation to this community. And later on in this this, um, town, later on this year, we're going to celebrate. And we're not going to celebrate, all right? Well, we're not going to celebrate anything, all right? But we can celebrate that 150 years ago, somebody came here and brought a message. So he says here, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. If one thing that quarantine taught us was, I think, was that a whole lot of the things that we used to, uh, that we would say weighed us down, when it was taken away, we still survived. All those times when we said, oh, I'm, I'm too busy to do this, or I'm too busy to go there, when quarantine came, we found out what was important and what wasn't, and what we could take out of our lives that were making us busy that we didn't really need there. Today we live with devices. We constantly have telephones. We constantly have um, um, noise being projected into us. Um, There is no rest for our mind There is no rest for our heart. Constantly we're being pumped with information. We've been been told what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight. Let's find out what he's really saying is, Let's find out what is important and what isn't. Let's learn to define what we need and what we don't need. Let's let's learn to sort out the things that are going to make a change and the things that are important in our life. Let's lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. 
So when we think of sin, we usually think of something somebody else does. When I was in Bible college, one of our lecture, lecturers, he, um, Cecil Mulvey, he was an Irishman, and so I appreciated his humor because I come from an Irish background. And he said, the definition of sin is something that my neighbor does that I don't do. And, and that's how we look at things in the world. And if you've traveled the world, you'll see that things in our culture that we think are all right, in other cultures they think they're really bad. And you go to different churches and you, 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 they'll come up to you and say, oh, but in your country you do this and this. And I think, yeah, that's all right. But they don't think. But in their country they do that and that. And I think, how can you do that and be a Christian? And we define things according to our culture, according to how we've been brought up, and how according to um, our, our worldview. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we can call sin. But sin is simply disobeying God. That's all. What did Adam and Eve do? Did they do a major, major sin? They, Adam didn't go out and rape somebody because there was nobody else to do it, I guess. They didn't do anything really corrupt. What they did was Eve stole the piece of fruit and Adam received stolen goods. And that changed the whole world. Changed the whole concept of how things were going to be. Because he didn't, they, didn't, they didn't listen to, to what the Spirit of God was saying. You see, it doesn't matter to you, and neither it should, what I consider sin and what I don't consider sin. Because I might be wrong and you might be wrong, or you might be right and I might be right, or I might be right and you might be wrong, or you might be wrong and I might be right, I don't know. But I know this, that if it is contrary to what God is saying, it is sin. So that means every day, every day, I sin. Because the first commandment is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your mind. And I honestly can't say that I do that. You might be able to say you can, but I know that, that for 24 hours and for 60, 60 minutes of those 24 hours and 60 seconds of those minutes, I'm not loving, loving God all the time but I know about the mercy of God. So what he is saying is, he's saying, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily snares us. He's saying, don't let the things that you do wrong stop you from doing the things, the right things. So Romans chapter 7 says that. Paul says, the things that I should do, I don't. And the things that I shouldn't do, I do. When I read that scripture, I had immense relief because I thought if the great apostle Paul was having the same problems as me, well, I'm all right. And you see here, he says, 
Don't let those things weigh you down. Don't let them be a hindrance to you. Sure, work them out. But don't let them stop you from being who you should be in Christ. So he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before you or before us. We have a, we have a course to go. You know, there's nothing worse. When I, I used to be an athlete, and um, you can tell that, can't you? <laughs> Just looking at me. You can see, you know, there's a six-pack here. <laughs> yeah. I hide it. Well out of respect for other older people. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yes. Yes so that they don't get depressed and things. So there's a covering of, of um, fat. <laughs> that is there. It's just there for the winter. Yes. Um, when I was an athlete, when I was younger, I didn't like to lose. I'm not too keen on losing now. But I accept that um, losing is character building. And so if I was running a race and I thought I was going to lose, I'd, oh, and I would limp back. So I really didn't lose, you know. It was my... It was my injury that, you know, that guy was lucky that he won because of my leg. But you see, we might laugh at that. But God's given each and every one of us a race to run. He's given us a course to follow. Not just the people that stand up here, but every one of us, we have a purpose And you know, I hear people now and they don't want to come to church anymore. And I'm not talking about people that are sick or things like that. But I'm talking about people that are quite able, but they'll, they'll just watch it on the TV because it suits them better. Well, if you come to church solely to get... Well, you're, you're running the wrong race because it's about giving. If you want to be Christ-like, and people quite often ask me this, and especially young people, they say, how can I be Christ-like? Well, I say give. And when you say give, people think, how much? <laughs> but I'm not talking about how much you give and, and dollar signs. I'm talking about how much you're prepared to sacrifice that other people, that other people can receive what you already have. And you know, I'd like to think that I lived my life. And, and I've, had a, I, I've had a very, very adventurous life. And as I get older, it gets more and more adventurous and and I get, I get more excited about what God is doing, you know. And sometimes people say to me, aren't you, aren't you getting a little bit old for all that stuff now? Well, I don't think so. My, my Methuselah, he was the... And he lived to, what, 365 or something? 900. All right. Now, I was just talking until when he got old enough to get married. 
<laughs> but you see, we've got a, we've all got a purpose, and we've got a we've got a um, a pathway to to follow, and. What are you prepared to do that? What's your, what's your excuse for not doing it? What do you say? Oh, I'm too old, or I'm tired, or I'm too busy. Well, if you're too busy to follow what God wants for you, shouldn't you look at the rest of your life and see what you can take out of your life so that you can fulfill what God wants you to do. Out there, in a, in a 25 or 30 kilometer radius, there are thousands of people who don't understand the love of God in their life. They don't understand that. They don't hear it. And why is that? Why don't they hear it? They don't hear it because we're not relating it. We're not relating it. You know, um, there used to be a businessman in this town. And he said to me, when any, any, whenever anybody came into his business that was new in the community, he would tell them to come to our church because we had a, a wide range of different nationalities, different age groups and things like that. And he said to me, but I'll never come because I don't believe in that stuff. I'd like to see that man come. Because for so somehow, he's directing people here for the social interaction, which is very good. It's good to have that. But we've also got a message, a message of love, a message that God has given to people. So he says... We are to run with endurance. That means, endurance means that there's a bit of a struggle, you know. I don't know, I wasn't really into long distance running. I liked, I liked middle distance running because it was over and done with, you know. Running a marathon to me was just, I, I, I ran some long races and I'd be thinking, when's this going to finish, you know? When am I going to get to the end of this? When I got the prize, I was very happy that I endured. But you see, right now, I don't live for the prize. Because to me, the prize to me is to see a drug addict that's no longer on drugs to see a broken family now together. Yes. To see a depressed person rejoicing. Yes. Whatever it is, to see somebody's life changed. And the only way I see that is, is to see it in Jesus Christ. Is to see it in Jesus. So we're to endure the race that is before us, looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. So Jesus has already written the book. He's already written the book. And you know, I've, I, well, I'll tell you a story. I used to be a postman in Aranui Post Office in Christchurch. And I was there 
since I was a, a boy, you know. It was, I, I, um, I started my life off when I was 15 delivering telegrams. So there'd be a few people here that knew what telegrams were and other people would have no idea what telegrams was. But it was the internet of the day. And so I'd get on, somebody would send a message and you'd do it through the post office. And I'd get on my push bike and I had a little bag round and they used to dress us up in uniforms like we are in the army. We'd have a hat on with a peak and brass buttons and the weather would be hot and the uniforms weren't really good for hot weather. And they give me this envelope and it'd have an address on it and I would drive, uh, no, ride my bike across Christchurch. Then I got promotion and I became a postman. And I was in Christchurch in, in Arunui in this post office. And there was a Christian man there and he was an older man and he talked to everybody about Jesus. But he never talked to me. And then another man came as a post offer uh, uh, to be a postman, and his name was Spence. And Spence lived across the road from me, and all he did was talk about Jesus. And eventually I got saved. And the other Christian, Arnold, he came up to me after I got saved. And he said, I'm just so glad that you came to Jesus. He said, because I didn't think it was possible. He said, I never bothered with you because I thought you were so bad that you'd never get saved. Well, he didn't read his Bible very well, did he? Because the Apostle Paul went round when he was Saul persecuting the church, he stood and held the coats of the people that threw the stones at, at Stephen. He stood there. And then eventually God interrupted his life and he became probably the most significant person in the Bible. And you see, God has already written a story. And it's already finalized. It's finished. Our faith. God has set a path for us. But I don't want to get to heaven and know that I didn't fulfill the faith that God had in me. Not because I didn't do it right but because I know that the Father in heaven loved me so much that he sent his son to die for me. And he trusted me so much that he gave me a responsibility, a purpose to go out and tell others and to speak into other people's lives. And all I want to hear is and from time to time, people say to me, they say, ah, oh, you'll get a lot of reward when you get to heaven. Well, my reward, all I want is to get to heaven. And it has nothing to do with what I did or what I didn't do. It has to do with the love of God. He's the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know, we look at the cross and we think, wow, how did he do that? And as I've said uh, other times, we think of the physical. And we think of the physical and that Jesus went through abuse, but the abuse that Jesus went through wasn't just the physical. 
It was the spiritual. It's when God the Father had to turn his back on him, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? But he did that with joy. He was able to endure that because he knew that one day in Otauta, there'd be a group of people that would meet together, that would worship and love the Father because of what he did. He despised the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the Father in the throne of God. And right now he's sitting there and he's making intercession for you and for me. What I want to ask you today is where are you at? What is your excuse? And I don't want to accuse you because I need to ask myself is what is the excuse that I don't do what God wants me to do? And certainly, I don't want you to come, come into condemnation. Because God says there is no condemnation. But what I want you to do is, I want you to ask God. God, am I doing what you want me to do? And if I'm not, what is it that's standing in the way? Perhaps I want to be well liked in the community. Perhaps I want to be well respected in the community. And so I sacrifice my, my testimony or I sacrifice my relationship with you. I don't know. I want you to ask, Father in heaven, you love me so much. that you sent your son to die for me. Jesus, you loved me so much that you you gladly went to the cross for me. And Holy Spirit, you loved me so much that you've risen from the grave to give me direction to who I can be and what I can be. And I'm not saying you don't have to be a great evangelist that that preaches to thousands of people. Perhaps God just wants you to, to speak to the person that lives next to you or whatever. You know, we have all different have we have different roles. And I've told you the story that um that I once heard Billy Graham say in an interview in the when the person said to Billy Graham that was interviewing him, well, when you get to heaven, you'll get great reward. And he said, why? And, she, and, and, and um, she said, because of all the souls that you've led to the Lord. And he said, I wouldn't have led one of those people if somebody else hadn't have invited me. To. They will get the reward. And so you don't have to be, it might be that you just, you just speak to somebody in their moment of crisis or their moment of need. And it happens. But what I want to ask you is, we live in a world that is now rioting because they can't murder babies. We live in a country that every day, almost every day this week, somebody's been stabbed or attacked just randomly in this nation of ours.
some of the older people in this congregation will remember when they were younger. If somebody got murdered, it was a big deal. Everybody followed the case and things because murder was such an uncommon thing. Now it happens every day, one way or the other. And we can sit back and we can say, wow, we live in a rotten world, don't we? Or we can say, Lord, what is my role in this to change it? What is my role in this? Where do you want me to be in all this? So I'm going to ask the, the worship team if they'll come back. And we're going to sing that, that song again. Um, hallelujah. Angus Day. Holy, holy. Eh? The last one that we sang. And we're going to stand while we sing it. And I'm going to ask you right where you are. Will you ask the Father? How can I be part of the change? How can I be part of the answer? Instead of being part of the, instead of moaning about the result of things that are happening, how can I be part of the answer? Lord, show me. You're the author and the finisher of my faith. Tell me what my storyline is. Show me what it is that you want me to do that will bring about a better community, a better world that we'll see more people in the kingdom of God than in the kingdom of darkness. Let's stand and sing it, shall we? Praise God. Hallelujah. we just come to you now and Father we just thank you that you've called us you have a path for us that we just don't exist but we exist for a purpose and we thank you Lord for that and Father as we just sang that song, people 
just spoke to you themselves and asked you the question. Father, I pray that you'll give them the answer. It's a personal thing, Lord, between them and you. It's nobody else's business. Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll come and you'll speak to them. In Jesus' name, speak into their hearts. Lord, I just ask this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. What I want to do now is, just while we're in this um, atmosphere of prayer, if you need healing, or if you have any problem that needs prayer, I want you to come right now, and we're just going to pray for you. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just pray for my sister now, Lord. I just pray that.